Thank you so much for having me. It really is an honor to come back here. Suzanne and I really do uh, consider this congregation to be our home congregation, uh, where our, our, our love and devotion is in this group of people and this community of love and spirit. I, you know, when you retire, one of the neat things you get to do is you get to teach what you want to teach, not what you're told to teach and things like that. And one of the neat things I was done, it's always been intriguing to me, is ethical dilemmas. Why do we have them? What are they? Are they unresolvable, etc.? And, you know, I, um, so I taught a class on it. And what this is, this tonight, it's distilling this down, uh, a whole class, a long class, into um, uh, one hour or maybe less. And leaving out a lot, but hopefully we're going to get a lot in. I hope I don't overwhelm you. Um, what are ethical dilemmas? Ethical dilemmas are when you have one or more aspects of an outcome that are in conflict with each other, where there's good outcomes and bad outcomes, and you might not know exactly what to do. Now, I'm kind of crazy about this. I look in the newspaper every day, and I look on the TV, and I see all the problems we got in Rome. I see ethical dilemmas everywhere I look. All of them are ethical dilemmas, and most people on both the left and the right think they're simple answers. Oh, I got the answer. You know, it's very simple. But they don't see the other side, shall we say, but also the fact that they're, many times they're choosing between some radical conflicts. Um, just today, this is some of the things in the paper today. Another broken promise on immigration. Now, immigration is certainly one of those where we have great dilemmas. We want to be compassionate to people, but then we also have the aspect that we want to protect our borders. We have the right to choose who we want in our own community, the, the problems of cost, etc. And here's another one here. This one is um, uh, the boom in energy spurs industry in the Rust Belt. Well, it's talking about the gas and oil production that's boomed here. Well, on one hand, it's getting rid of coal, and it's only got 40% of the CO2, but because of the low cost energy, it's, it seems like it's accelerating the use of fossil, more fossil fuels, fuels in that sense. Here's another one. Cops get hardwares with few strings. Well, we want to do something with this outdated equipment we've got. You don't want to just scrap it in some cases. You know, there are criminals sometimes who board themselves up and uh, you want to protect the law enforcement people, but yet what we saw in Ferguson, Missouri, it instigates a whole series of things that uh, uh, leads to, shall we say, public and open warfare. So there's a dilemma there in trade-offs. Here's another one. Um, shifting polls in Scotland sends investors running for shelter. They're facing ethical dilemmas between they want their own freedom, they want their own autonomy, etc. But yet there's downsides to that. They've been interlinked with Great Britain for 400 years, and undoing that is going to cost them plenty. So is that worth it? Um, here's another one. Um, Longtime rivals look to team up to confront ISIS. Uh, here we are, we were against Syria, and now we're there for them. Talk about ethical dilemmas going on all over the place. Do we line up with Assad? Do we, you know, uh, these are serious issues that we're looking at. In many cities, police are struggling for diversity. Uh, and here's the last one, which is perfect, because they're talking about ethical questions of the movie The Giver. And this is where they, it's a science fiction movie that's out, where they're eliminating uh, emotions, because emotions are where it gets people in trouble, but yet it's one of the core aspects that makes us human. So do we want the good life, or do we want the free life? Serious ethical questions there. Um, I see ethical dilemmas, like I say, everywhere, maybe too much. <laughs> but I hope to let you see some of these. What's interesting, I taught this class, by the way, at University of South Carolina, and there was a brand new professor there, and he says, well, guess what I wrote my thesis on? He says, ethical dilemmas and why they don't really exist. <laughs> and by the time I got done with my, this talk, he said, you know, you just trashed my entire 
PhD thesis. <laughs> <coughs> We have to remember that a great many people, as William James said, think they're thinking when you're really just uh, rearranging your prejudices. And that's all of us. We, it's called a confirmatory bias. We get an idea of something and we look around us for evidence that confirms our opinion of the whole situation. Everybody left and right does that, and especially on ethical dilemmas. I'm going to cut to the chase here and give you three major reasons why we have ethical dilemmas. There's philosophical reasons, there's reasons of value, and there's neuropsychological reasons. We'll talk about all of these. Any one of those would be a deal killer, which means that there is no right answer. We live in a state of ambiguity. So we'll talk about some of these. There's real ethical dilemmas out there. I've got some of these here. Abortion, torture, torture, ethical education of illegal immigrants, time at work versus time of ch children with children, euthanasia, universal medical care, animal rights, divorce, economic justice versus freedom, affirmative action, adult children movements. Shall we let them move back in with us? Um, I, in my drug addiction work, by the way, it's a serious problem all the time because many times the child addict wants to come back and just use the house as a flop house. And in fact, uh, tomorrow night I've got a smart recovery group going and one of the women is kicking her daughter out. Uh, and it's terribly, it's very hard for her, but she's facing a real ethical dilemma. A drug addictions with chronic pain victims. I used to work with uh, Mary and Joy Hospital up here in Wheaton, and that has 70% uh, of people that are on, uh, with pain problems or addicted to something. So wait a second, is that good or bad? There's, and I have personal experience with that, uh, in, with members of this congregation where it was a serious issue. Organ harvesting, bombing of Iran, spousal issues, we could go on and on. They're real, they're all around us. We live in them all the time, we're immersed in these. Here's a classic one, I'm euthanasia. All our ethics comes from values. Humanism, humanism is about beliefs, it's about our values. And we have all kinds of values, we got values most of us have what we call higher values of justice, freedom, love, compassion, reason, community, music, trees, and I would add butterflies, and probably down at the bottom of the list, maybe at the top of the list, chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> we have all of these values, and, I'm gonna, and I think I spoke on this one time before. There's two great philosophers to me in the 20th century, John Dewey and Isaiah Berlin. Isaiah Berlin is the most overlooked one, especially for one most incredible, simple, it's very simple, his, this idea he talks about. We talk about in the UU church about pluralism. He was the one who actually coined that term pluralism, by the way. But what he meant by it is totally different the way it's used today. He talks about the fact that each of us have multiple high values, and they are all in radical conflict with each other and they're unresolvable, irresolvable conflicts. And there's always trade-offs, always trade-offs. He talks about it being a um, tragic liberalism, and I love that word tragic. It is tragic. We want things to be simple. We want things to be pure. We want love to be pure, right? But tell that to the, the spouse that's being beat up. Love isn't always pure. All of our values are radical conflict. That's what he meant by pluralism. But with all those values of radical conflict, we have trade-offs. And there's no, I underline, rational way to decide between them. There's no rational way. That's the dilemma we faced. And um, I'll give you an example. In when we make one value over all the others, it becomes a secular god. Now, the communists, they made a secular god out of economic freedom. 
And it consumed and subsumed all other values, including justice and freedom and compassion. And 30 million people died in the Stalinistic purges for that, that secular God. Skip to today. The libertarians make a secular God out of freedom, consuming and subsuming all other values, including justice, love, compassion. And what happens out of that? 45,000 people died last year for lack of medical care in the United States. This is what happens when we place one value over the others. And by the way, is why the title of my book about what's going on in Unitarian Universalism is when we don't, when we get skewed values, when we make one value over all the others, it gets unbalanced. And we'll be talking about that this weekend. But there's no right way out of these things. What we do know, there's balance and hard choices. I'll tell you a story. This is a true story. In 1884, four English sail sailors were stranded at sea in a small rowboat. Their ship had gone down at sea. Just like we think about lifeboat ethics, this is true lifeboat ethics. Uh, it was the Minion, went down in a storm. They only had two cans of preserved turnips and no fresh water. Thomas Dudley was the captain. Edwin Stevens was the first mate. Edwin Brooke was a sailor. All men of excellent character. They also had a young boy of 14, a cabin boy. It was Richard Parker. It was his first time at sea. And he had signed up on the advice of his friends in, quote, in the hopefulness of youthful ambition, thinking the journey would make a man of him. Sadly, it was not to be. They, watched, they sat in the lifeboat for many days, after the first three days, and after the fourth day, they caught a turtle. They lay, lived on the back for eight days, but they ate nothing. Now Parker, the cabin boy, was lying in the corner of the lifeboat, and he had drank some salt water. The, the crew, other three men, told him, don't drink the salt water, and he was uh, appearing to be dying. He was, he was in great agony. He was quite ill. On the 19th day, now they've gone 19 days with no water or other than that turtle, etc. cetera, um, the captain, Dudley, suggested drawing lots to see who would kill um, uh, uh, the, the cabin boy. But Brooks failed, uh, refused to do so, so no lots were drawn. The next day came and no ship was in sight. Dudley told Brooks to avert his gaze and motioned to Stephen that Barker had to be killed. They offered a prayer, told the boy its time had come, and killed him with a penknife, stabbing him in the jugular vein. He and Brooks, though, emerged from the conscientious objection to share in the gruesome bounty. For four days, the men fed on the body and blood of the cabin boy. And then help came. Dudley describes, and listen to this carefully, he describes their rescue in his diary with the staggering euphemism on the 24th day, we were having our breakfast and when a ship appeared at last. They went to, to uh, court. Uh, they were put on trial for their supposed crime of killing this totally innocent cabin boy. This is real life. This isn't, uh, I won't tell you the outcome right now, maybe later. But it was a classic, very serious ethical dilemma. Now, most of us don't have that kind of serious ethical dilemmas in our life, but we have a lot of ones every single day. You know, ethical dilemmas start with the fact that all ethics starts with the fact that we're in an ethical dilemma. We're really, all ethical decisions are based upon looking at the difference between what is right for us and what is right for the community around us, right? Now, if I'm going to be purely ethical for the other person, I'd say give up all my, all my possessions and give it away. Or I could go the other way and say, no, I got mine, you keep yours. Most of us are somewhere in between. So each of us makes a decision on that spectrum. We don't think it's a hard choice, but think of it this way. Every time we go to the movie and spend $12 or $16, where I am, for a 3D movie, that's probably enough to, to save the life of someone in India. That's real. That's real.
there's a field in ethics called trolleyology. I actually have over 200 of these. <laughs> I collect, I, you know, put, some people collect stamps. I collect what's called trolleyology. The, the ethicist Philip Foot first came up with this. This is a trolley. Let's say it's a San Francisco trolley, and it's going down a hill, a steep hill, and all of a sudden the brakes are lost. And it's running pell-mell and can't stop. Now it turns out that it's coming down from, this, from the top side here. It's coming down, and it's hurtling down the track, and there's four, five workers in the way. They don't see the trolley coming. You have no way of notifying them. But you're standing on the side, and you have a switch to switch it off to a shunt. And that shunt, though, there's one person there. So you've got to decide whether one person is going to die or five, okay? Very similar to the lifeboat story we saw, but this is very abstract, and it's meant to be abstract and pure because it's meant to not let you evade the thing. Like in the lifeboat, you might say, well, let's wait another day or something like that. No, there's no waiting. It's coming down there. You've got to make a decision. Is it going to be five people or one? So how many people would hit the switch to, to shut it over to the one person? How many would do that? Okay, how many would uh, let, the, let it go on and kill the five people? And how many are going to lie and not end the big question? <laughs> Cowards! Cowards! <laughs> it's a tough decision, right? Let's move on. Let's say that trolley's coming down and it's going to kill the five people, but you're on an overpass. See the overpass here? You're standing right there, but there's a fat man right there, probably me. But you're not light enough. You know that you could push that fat man down in the way of the trolley. It would stop the trolley and save the five people. So do you push me <laughs> over the edge to save those five people? How many people would push me over the edge and save the five people? Suzanne, of course, you know, absolutely bloodthirsty. <laughs> okay, and how many would uh, not do anything and just let the, the, oh my God, all these cowards, come on, mess up, make, make a decision. This is real life. It's hard, right? Why is it hard? Anybody? Why is it hard? Because you have to directly, your direct action is. Like exactly, that's part of it, that's part of it. Okay, let's get around that then. Let's say that there's a trap door here and I got a switch, just like we did before. I got a switch and I'm gonna drop that bad person down there. Is that okay? <laughs> well, wait a minute, it's a switch. We're not really pushing it now. We're gonna drop it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anybody got an answer on that? Well, does it matter? Does it matter putting a label on this? It's very clear if I push you, it's murder. On the other hand, as I think about it, if I push the switch and it goes to the one person, that's also murder. But if I let the train hit five people, that isn't murder because I didn't do it. Well, get let's get beyond the labels, murder and things like that. And maybe let's just say they're killed. The outcome is five versus one in either case, right? You're choosing who dies and who. Except that, except that my involvement, I, I didn't do anything. Right. In this case here, in this case here, the reason one of the reasons we find it offensive is because we're actually pushing a person. Or even this pressing way. the button or pressing the switch yeah. is in fact. Okay. Reason. So let's let's go back to this one. The five versus one. Now, most of you, only a few of you said that you wouldn't get the switch. What if this person over here is a loved one? Let's say it's your child, your husband or wife, your mother, a father, someone you love very deeply. How many would flip the switch? Whoa, all of a sudden it can change this up. Are you situational <laughs> ethicist? <laughs> We're going to get, I want you to remember this example and how you changed your moral theory midstream because of, of a bias, personal bias, yes? What if the fat man you're pushing is Mussolini? 
there's a gap. That changes the whole equation. I had used the original example. He's an innocent person. You don't even know this person. Well, this goes back to your first point, value. Which, which do you value? Yeah. Yeah, I, if you go to the principle of, for instance, on the positive side, choosing the route that would do the most good for the most people, the, the reverse or the converse or something of that would be doing the least harm for the most people. Thank you for that segue. <laughs> because what I want to get into next is that I want you to think about <clears throat> All, I, I, this class I got on moral theory, I got 39 different moral theories. Hone it down, but um, almost all of them, not all of them, almost all of them could be put in one of two categories. We can think about it either the, by focusing on the act or the consequences. We can focus on the means or the ends. We can talk about the right, the right way, shall we say, to do something, or the good. What is going to end up being the overall good? Another way is, what are our first principles we're going to adhere to, or the, whatever the projected outcome is? Now, each of these, by the way, in ethical theory, means a little bit something different. But in general, they got this. You see the same framework there. You're focusing either on the act or the consequences. Now, you said we should focus on the consequences rather than the act. So let's. Look at this. There's two, by the way, um, there's two great ethical theories we're going to talk about that pretty much dominate all ethical theory. And the first one is the acting on the consequences. The most important consequential, underlying consequential theory, looking at the consequences, as you well know, is utilitarianism. Now, utilitarianism is saying, we're going to do the ethically right act, which produces the greatest good for the greatest number, and conversely, by the way, the least suffering for the most people. But the greatest good for the greatest number. And um, real world example, in World War II, um, when the B-2 and B-1 bombers were bombing London, they were dropping short. They were hitting in South London, where uh, it was just poor people, and it wasn't an industrialized area, and certainly wasn't the heart of London. They knew that they had German spies in, in, in England at that time, and they didn't want them to know that they were dropping short and they should redirect. So they put out uh, uh, false things to the newspaper saying, my God, it's wrecking, the, the hitting dead on in the center of, of London and everything else. And it, Nazis never adjusted their thing. But, and um, Churchill made this decision. He knew that in South London it was very populous with the poor people. He, he made a purposeful decision to do that. That's a case of trying to do the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, so to clarify, you're saying he actually misinformed. He misinformed the press purposely. They put out false information because they knew that the Nazis would be reading the newspapers and they were making it like it was hitting the center where it really wasn't. Oh, okay. Mike, not correcting incorrect information is different than putting out false information. Right, right. But the point is he's trying to, he's looking at the consequences, right? Right. Here's, a, I go through a whole long thing about consequentialism, especially utilitarianism, but it's saying the greatest good for the greatest number. There's about four major reasons when you look at ethics, ethics why people say that utilitarianism has some serious flaws. The biggest one, I will tell you, is this. It's protection of minorities. It's the protection of minority interests. And I'll tell you a little story. Do you all know um, Ursula Le Guin? You know, the, the science fiction writer, Ursula Le Guin, she wrote a, um, a short story called um, The Ones Who Walked Away from Omelas. Now, she tells the story of Omelas, a city um, of happiness and civic celebration, a place without kings or slaves, without advertisements or stock exchange, a place without an atomic bomb, lest it become too unrealistic. 
The author imagines is one more thing after all this wonderful, perfect life, though. In a basement, under one of the most beautiful buildings in Omalas, or perhaps in a cellar of one of its spacious private homes, there is a room. And in this, and in this room, it has one locked door and no window. And in this room sits a child. The child is feeble-minded, malnourished, and neglected. It lives out its days in wretched misery. In the corner of that room, there's a mop, and the child is afraid of that mop. The people that come to bring little food and water, they do bring, um, never talk to her, never interact with her. They just place the food in there and leave. And she begs out because she remembers an earlier time. She says, let me out, let me out. I'll be good. I'll be good. Let me out. But everybody in Omalas knows it's there. They also know that all of their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their relationships, the health of their children, and even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weathers of their skies depend wholly on this child's misery. If this child were brought out of the sunlight into a, uh, this vile place, and it was being cleaned and, and fed and comforted, that would be a good thing. But on that very day, in that hour, all of the prosperity and beauty of Omas would wither and be destroyed. That's the terms of Omas. Now, if that doesn't touch a nerve, a visceral nerve about you, it certainly is a city and a culture we're talking about where it's the greatest good for the greatest number. But there's something else that's missing. It's human autonomy. It's human worth and dignity. The first principle of all human ethics is to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of each person. We're not doing it in this case. In this case, the the ethics is demanding this child suffer needlessly. Not need, no, I'm sorry, not needlessly, but because of these other things. This is the problem with utilitarianism. Yeah. Well, but it is needless because that's all myth. I mean, that's all made up. That, um, of course it's a myth. I, I, I'm sorry, so this is science fiction. So the myth and, and... No, no, no. This in the myth, this is a science fiction, but we're saying this is true. This no, is, I don't accept it. Well, <laughs> I think, but I think the, the metaphor works well. It's, it's a metaphor. All you have to do is plug in any oppressed minority group. You got it. You got it. Slavery is still being justified. Did you hear the yeah. latest? You know, they're trying to justify slavery yeah. economically because it was good for the slaves. I mean, absolutely absurd. By the way, I live in an area that a, a mile and a half away from me is a large, gigantic oak tree live oak tree, huge, you know, 200 foot wide. It's called the hanging tree. You know why it's called the hanging tree? Can you guess? There's plantation right up from us. Where I was in Wilmington, 1898, there was a slaughter of, of uh, we don't know how many people, but there was nine heads on pikes put there. And the road there is still labeled on some maps as nigger head pike. They took over, it was the first, the first and only insurrection in the United States where our government was completely overthrown. It was 70% of the blacks. Uh, people were black there, they had black in the street. They killed them all, ran them all, rest out of town. And guess what? All the parks, all of the, the major things, there was nine conspirators that led the thing. And guess what? All, they ended up with all the land, all the parks, the you streets. Also Right. Well, in this case, what we're talking about, though, is utilitarianism is saying the greatest good for the greatest number, but there's problems with it. In other words, it's not pure. It's not, it's not without problems. 
Calvin and Hobbes. I don't believe in ethics anymore. As far as I'm concerned, the end justifies the means. Get what you can while the getting's good. That's what I say. Mike makes Mike. The winners write the history books. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so I'll do whatever I have to. Let others argue whether it's right or not. He pushes it. He says, why did you do that? Well, you were in my way. Now you're not. The end justifies the means. Well, I didn't mean for everyone, you dolt, just me. There's another great theory that focuses not on the consequences, but on the act. And the great expositor of that was Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant hated utilitarianism. And he said that we should be doing things not because of the, what ends up the good out of it, but because it's the right thing to do. It's our duty to do things, certain things. And we find these principles by universal principles that are universally applicable. We don't kill people because all people agree that killing is wrong. We don't lie, we don't cheat, we don't steal, because everybody agrees these things are wrong. And his, his you know, most of us were lucky we come up with one good idea. Kant came up with two great ones. And the first one is here, act only according to the maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it be, should become a universal law. In other words, if you see it universally applicable, it should become a universal law. Don't kill because it's universally and, but, you know, in some cases you have to be careful because I let my conscience be my guide and it turned out to be a sociopath. Um, you can't always quite be sure here. Here's another problem with act-based ethics. Christian ethics is what we call normative ethics or deontological ethics. It's based upon the idea that there are certain right ways to do things, right? And they're written down maybe in God's law, or natural law even, but these are universally applied principles that we can live by. The problem is, I don't know of any that are pure. There isn't, there isn't some um, uh, way that we can say that there's an exception. The classic example is, and this was a true example, we, as we well know during World War II, the Nazis would come knocking at the doors of people who were hiding the Jews. And they said, are there Jews in here? And they would say yes or no. If they say yes, well, guess what? They're obeying the law, Kant's law. And Kant would say that they would, should say yes, by the way. Uh, he never had, the, you know, he was before the Nazis, but he said, you always tell the truth. So they would say, yes, we have Jews here. Uh, and the consequentialist would say, wait a minute, I'm going to do, uh, I've, I've got a problem here. I've got two ethical principles, uh, truth and protection of innocent people, right? That's the problem with rule-based ethics, is that there's exceptions, and again, they are in radical conflict with each other. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase here on something. These are two great moral theories, consequential and act-based ethics. And in both cases, they are incredibly uh, <clears throat> rational, consistent, coherent. They make sense. They, you know, we use them in our lives. But yet, if one is true, the other can't possibly be true. If we're going to act on the consequences, that means that we can't act, we can't consider the, the, uh, the, the rules, that the, the there's ethical rules. By the same kind, if you're, if you're Manuel Kant, you act absolutely morally every day. And from everything we know from his history, he did. He was an absolutely moral person on those principles. But he didn't really get into the, when he started giving examples, he didn't get into really tough examples. There's... Yes. I remember a discussion about this in college a hundred years ago. And it was the story of there's a flashing red light, and there's a red light, and you're on a country road, and nobody's there. And you can see for miles, there's no car coming the other way. Do you stop, or do you go through the light? Okay. And my thought was, and I'm not sure which camp this put it in, okay? Sure, you can go through the light because there will be no consequences. There's no cop, there's no cars, it's okay. 
that the act would be, well, it's red and you should stop because that's an absolute rule. But my thought was from a pragmatic point of view, if I get in the habit of going through red lights, I will go through the red light someday just because I've done it now and that rule is exactly. not you So what if I do What did you just do though? You gave for the same situation, ethical dilemma, both act basis and consequential ethics considerations for it. Do you see? Because if I, yeah, I, I'm going to break the rule, but if I break the rule, there's consequences if everybody starts breaking the rule. Or even for me personally. Right, exactly. For you too. Right, you get okay. in the habit. So, so I have changed. Since so, this, so uh, by the way, what I'm giving you tonight, in the last five to seven years, there's been a tremendous revolution in ethics and ethical theory, and especially ethical psychology. And we're going to be getting into this from here. This is kind of the old theories and everything else. And we know that there's basic problems with these. So other people have come up with different things. Alistair McIntyre came up with the um, Aristotel brought back the Aristotelian virtues, that really there is no underlying basis for moral theory, ultimate moral theory. There isn't one moral theory, but we can do is provide people with, with um, uh, uh, those ethical virtues that make us good. Uh, you know, we talked about the Aristotelian virtues of courage. Courage is is uh, the median between foolhardiness on one side and cowardice on the other, right? There's a mean there. And they're looking at all of these things, virtues of trustworthiness, honesty. In other words, not looking at the theory, but how does it affect people? Do we act out of love? Much in the, in the Unitarian Church today, a lot of the emphasis is on, on uh, love. But again, remember I told you about love. Love has downsides as well. All of our ethical virtues have downside as well. And yet, and also with Aristotelian virtues, it doesn't give us an overarching theory to tell us what to do. It's not enough. It's both, um, um, all of these different theories um, have good, um, uh, what should I say, predictive things that um, when we actually look at the end consequences, but we don't know which consequence we want to shoot for. Sorry to interrupt again, but what about the con what about the concept of unintended consequences? Exactly too. Yeah, you know, that gets it. But this is where you kind of kind of you know what we're talking about right now is where we can kind of get a picture of that. Now in reality, and we're gonna get more into that, most people don't look at the unintended consequences. I'm gonna change here and we're gonna start now going into ethical psychology where there's been a tremendous explosion of information the last few years. Very sophisticated experiments, especially with children and babies, where we really find out who, not what should we do, but how do we make ethical decisions? Yes? Ethical psychology or psychology of ethics? It's like both ways it goes, psychology of ethics, yeah. It's the, it, it's really looking at how we really do make these decisions. Yeah, we got all these That's theories. That's why I think psychology of yeah. ethics is important. Right. Yeah, um, so we're going to be looking at this. The first thing we're going to look at is, is evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology really started off with E.O. Wilson uh, in his book, Sociobiology, where it's really looking at, you know, before this uh, with the anthropologists were saying that all of our thinking is a tabula rasa, that we're uh, uh, creatures that can be built completely from form and we're all culture. I mean, Everything that came out of Boaz and Franz Boaz and um, Margaret Mead's studies and everything else. And so everybody believed that. I believed that for many years. And then all of a sudden, evolutionary psychology came on the side, scene and said, wait a minute. Not only do we have a nature, that it's actually much more important than, than uh, the culture in many cases. And they are interactive. But more important, <clears throat> this evolutionary psychology aspects of it are subconscious. We don't even see they're going on, and they influence all of our decisions. One of the first people, now I'm going to give these two examples here, or two quotes here. These were early on quotes, OK? We'll, we'll see how it evolves. So Mike Bruce says, morality, or more strictly, our belief in morality, is merely an adaptation put in place to further our reproductive ends. In an important sense, ethics, as we understand it, is an illusion Fogged off on islands by our genes, 
to get us to cooperate. The basic theory is that ethics is a is a cultural is a is an evolutionary adaptation that allows people in, in tribes. Remember, think back out in the African belt in small tribes. You got to get along. These are survival tools for that tribe and yourself. If you don't follow them and you get if you lie, cheat, or steal, or murder, or whatnot, you get kicked out of the group. And you're out on the African belt. What happens to you? You are dead. You are dead if you're not out if you're out there alone. You have very slim chance of survival. So Michael Gilson even speaks of it more harshly. He says, no hint of genuine charity ameliorates our vision of society once sentimentalism has been laid aside. What passes for cooperation turns out to be a mixture of opportunism and exploitation. Scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. Those are tough words. Since that time, evolutionary psychology has learned more that, um, and by the way, a real good primer on it to start, an early primer, is uh, Robert Wright's book, uh, The Moral Animal. Um, but all of these are trying to say that these, ap these adaptations for us are there to help us survive and reproduce. All of evolution is for that. And it's not just survive and reproduce us, it's our genes. So our genes, what we want to do is, is one famous uh, biologist said, I give up my life for two of my children or eight of my cousins. Think about it. Statistically, that's the amount of genetic material in them. Uh, here's the basic thing from evolutionary ethics. Why are we moral? It's because of kin selection, this selfish gene theory. I'm selfish. I want my genes to survive, so I'm going to do that. Group selection, this is controversial. This is real controversial between Eo Wilson and Richard Dawkins. I talked to Richard Dawkins at the last day of J conference a lot. It was, he was really scathing of, uh, of Wilson on this. And he loves Wilson, he really admires him, but um, it's whether it's individual selection or group selection. It doesn't mean anything for us here. I just understand there's a lot of underlying still learning going on in this. Reciprocal altruism. Scratch your back. Okay, I'll give you some food. I got some extra food. I'm going to give you some of the food, and you know, hopefully, you'll help me out. That helps you both survive. Reputational trust. It's really important that in a small tribe that you have a reputation of it being the good and caring person. And it's also a good survival technique for reproduction because those leaders who show have a reputation of trust, etc. These are the people that get more females for breeding purposes, et cetera. So it helps both reproduction and survival. Suzanne, I noticed when we were out in uh, Kauai, the, um, uh, we went to where the kings uh, had their uh, special little area, and they had fish ponds there. They had, um, you know, they had this little section. There. And even in Hawaii, believe it or not, protein was very starved low protein environment. And so they had animals there, they had fish there, and they had lots of women, again, survival and reproduction. It helps if, to be a priest or a minister <laughs> for survival and reproduction. Uh, the other way, it's, it's just basically, we, it, it's nature's way of helping us to get along in small tribes. That's what um, uh, being ethical and moral does. By the way, let me step back a second. At the last AHA conference, they were asking real tough questions, open audience, open mic, about different tough questions and people's short answers. They asked, is morality objective or relative? I answered this way. In a universe, in the big scheme of the universe, the universe doesn't care about morality. It doesn't care. It is totally relative. If I was in a dune-like world and there was dune-like animals, sandworms, etc., and imagine those sandworms only get together to breed once a year, and when they do, uh, they, they're toxic to each other. It's the only time they get together, they breed, and then like a praying mantis, the female eats the male and then gives off some more. Uh, but in that society of sandworms, and they're sentient beings, let's say they're sentient beings. In that world, uh, murder is, an accept is acceptable, right? Uh, and they sing beautiful songs to lure the male, and you know, it's 
basically fraud. Uh, it, it, it's a different world. My answer is that morality is an emergent property. We didn't just, we didn't, we're just not here uh, arbitrarily. It's relative, but not arbitrary. We live in a very definite world, a very objective world. With evolutionary background, we live in a world of necessity, of cause and effect, and that's where our morality comes from. It's an emergent property. So let's, let's think more about this evolutionary ethics, uh, why we're ethical, why we're ethical. We know why we're ethical. It works. It helps us survive and reproduce. Yes? I'm sorry, but could you, um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by emergent property. Emergent properties are properties like, let's take a snowflake. A, uh, a snowflake it starts off with um, uh, just water there, and it crystallizes. Emergent properties are properties, especially where um, self-organizing mechanisms take place. I don't know whether any of you know about it. Do you all remember Frank Cole? Some of you remember Frank Cole in this congregation. He was second command at the uh, at Fermi Lab. He's the one that donated the 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 the, the uh, yeah. piano. One of the most wonderful men I have ever met. He's a classic humanist. Uh, he. Um, was one of the founders, a lot of people didn't realize he was one of the founders of chaos and organization theory. Very modest man. Uh, and by the way, total talk about a humanist. The day he died, he felt he called up somebody really, uh, he was um, um, teaching, he was mentoring young men, um, uh, teaching them how to speak English and improve their English. And he called up somebody and told him he felt really bad, but he had a cancer that day because he wasn't feeling well. And, uh, that day he passed away. But uh, that's where emergent properties come from. The emergent properties that come from uh, a self organizing universe. Planets come together, the dust, because of gravity, they start organizing and right, coming together, heat up, sometimes form a star, sometimes explode like we are. And of course, we are stardust because we came from a, a red dwarf star. So these, these, um, Emergent properties like morality, love, and things like that, they're not in the universe, but they emerge out of who we are uh, as properties uh, uh, as we go up the chain. It's not all reductive. In other words, science isn't reductive. It has different levels of meaning, purposes. Um, let's go on here. And the real question is, how much of our morality is determined by our subconscious psychology. I ask you to really think about this. How much of what you do is to impress people in one way or another, to get that reputational trust? How much of it is guilt, maybe subconscious guilt? Well, I go, go and do that. Some of it is compassion. You just feel, you know, you feel bad about it. Uh, and we have these things in our genes. Um, Certainly, uh, uh, the conscience that we have, it's in our genes. We don't have to. And somebody said, well, what are you going to do if you're a humanist? You, you'll just go out there and rape and murder and kill. And I, I ask people, I say, well, would, if you stop believing right now, would you start rape and murder and kill? No. I said, of course not. You've learned it. You've seen your genes, and you've also learned it from a culturalization. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't think that evolution is all of it. The evolutionary drives, instincts, Etc. are the only thing. It's also culture. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And they interact together. But it is really important to understand, I think for ourselves, to be humble enough to know that we're not tabula rasa. And all the time, the subconscious is going and giving us inclinations, etc. Remember I started off with the William James uh, quote, much of our thinking is just rearranging our prejudices that's what the subconscious does. Out of this have come a whole series of studies. <clears throat> Jonathan Haidt is, is probably the most well-known, most important. He looked and he found that all of us have, uh, from these evolutionary drives, emotions, moral emotions. And they provide moral foundations. <coughs> this isn't foundations in a philosophical sense. This is in 
how people react to the world. Yes. What are his dates? Pardon? What are Hyde's dates? Uh, he came up with this theory about 2004. It really perceived uh, prominence about 2008. You know, Thank you. but it's uh, it, and since that time, by the way, all of these studies that he did have been reaffirmed by dozens, maybe even hundreds of researchers because it was so important in many countries. And what he found is these are the six main things that he sees, and it's not just cultural in the United States, in other places. And let's look at some of these. Care and harm, we have this natural inclination for caring for people and protecting them from harm. We have uh, uh, instinctual aspects of fairness and cheating. Think about it. If you go out and you, you're an African tribe and out of an African belt and uh, somebody finds an animal, kills it, and is hiding it and eating it themselves, uh, people in, in keeping their food from the rest of the people who are hungry, that's a serious breakdown of, of uh, uh, the social order there. So fairness and cheating are really important. You know, we have, we have finely attuned uh, uh, instincts for cheating. You know how people say you can shy, see a uh, lie? The best lie detector is it as good as a lot of people can see looking at certain muscles, etc. Studies have shown. And so we're highly evolutionary too for cheating and, and, and having fairness. So that's in our, in our genes. Liberty and oppression. We want to be free. We don't like being tyrannized. We don't like being controlled. Yes, in, the, in, in a lot of the hunter-gathering societies, there's the chieftain or the priestess, a priest that, that controls things. But even there, they can't get too out of line because they'll have problems. Also, there's the loyalty and betrayal to your group, uh, family and nation. Now, this is really important, as we'll find out later in some of the later studies that we've gone on. But loyalty or be betrayal to your group, I believe, is the most important thing that's going on today between the, in the culture wars, between the left and the right. I'm going around, Suzanne, and I, you know, Suzanne's the vice chairman of the uh, Democratic Party, where we're like, I'll be going door to door supporting her. and. Uh, I mean, the visceral reactions I get out of the right leaders, it's unbelievable. And the left leaders, too. In other words, this is my tribe. You can't touch any of that tribal instinct of, you know, you got to be a good old boy, you got to be, you know, a good old Baptist, you have to be you know, homophobic, you have to be anti woman. You know, this is, if you break down any one of those, then you're not a good old boy and you're not part of the tribe. That loyalty of the tribe is so important. Authority and subversion. Uh, <clears throat> authority and subversion where you, you bind yourself to the legitimate authority, that group leader, that tribal leader. Uh, and then sanctity, degrade, degradation. We have an instinctual uh, protective mechanism going on. We don't eat bad meat. We can smell it because we know it's dangerous. It's got botulism and, and uh, salmonella and things like that. So, um, these are really important things that affect us as we're going along in our moral decisions. Here's what's interesting, they found that again, cross-culturally, they found this out. The first three are highly uh, pressed more with liberals, where conservatives use all six. No, we all have all of these, we're all affected by all of these things, but liberals, tend to focus more on the first three, where conservatives will use all six and even more so on the last. That's why the subversion is, is so important. Uh, disgusting, you know, this disgusting thing. Many uh, conservatives find homosexuality disgusting. So they, you know, immediately make a moral decision about that. It's not a rational decision, it's a moral decision based upon that discuss the same way with with incest. Why is incest universal? Because of the intermarriage and screwing up the, the genes. But in one of the interesting studies that were done on that, they took children that were raised in the kibbutz. Did you know that children? This is the old kibbutz, not the recent, more recent kibbutzes. Um, and I talked to people who were raised in the kibbutz, and they verified this. In the kibbutz. 
Did you know that the rate of, of sex between the children is very, very low, and marriage between them very, very low? And the reason is they take the children away from the parents and are raised communally together. And in their mind, the theory is, they see all of these as their brothers and sisters. And there's uh, the yuck factor. Ugh, I'm not gonna have sex with my brother or sister, right? And um, it's, it's just the, the numbers, when you see the numbers, it was one of the early numbers that just pops out, just pops out. And interesting enough, now with the kibbutz is born, not having those restrictions, you know, the, such intensity where all the kids are together all day, all the time without the parents, and you know, it's breaking down. But this is really important to think about. When you're talking to a conservative, and I, I suspect most of you are liberal, <laughs> I know most of you, then the, uh, uh, you're operating on the first string and not the last string. Hyde, by the way, is considers himself an atheist and a liberal humanist, but he says that liberals are failing to understand if they want to get their point across, they got to use more of the last three. And he's been labeled conservative. I don't think he's totally conservative, but sometimes he does go over the edge a little bit. But um, authority, subversion, loyalty, betrayal, sanctity, degradation. You know, don't mess with my, my Jesus. That sanctity, that last one. Don't mess with my Jesus. You must be evil. Here's two other new ones, uh, Joshua Green and Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman is a very interesting guy. He is a psychologist, he was in Israel, and he, um, as a psychologist, got the Nobel Prize for Economics. Now, why did he get the Nobel Prize for Economics? He got the Nobel Prize for Economics because he showed that the market is not rational, that is, in fact, entirely emotional. <clears throat> and it's operating off of, guess what? Jonathan Haidt's principles, especially fear. It's a fear-based economy. <laughs> you know, they always talk about the market dropping twice as fast on fear than going up, you know, on, on hope. And it's true. But that economy looked at this, and for example, when he was in Israel, he was supposed to come up with a predictive test, he and his associate, for um, determining new young men who would make great leaders, officers in that. And so they were very cocky. They said, oh, so they, show, they gave him different, uh, um, these little experiments and, and uh, make-believe situations, and they watched how people, were, and they looked at, oh, this person definitely is going to be a leader, this one's not going to be. And you know what they found out later on, 10 years from that, five years from that? No credibility on what they figured out. Zero. They, their intuitions were entirely wrong. We talk about it. And there's a, now we're on your line here. These are expert intuitionists. As well as when they went to the intuitionists, the, the expert intuitionists with economics. That nobody wants to believe this, but the people on Wall Street, they're all making all these millions, have no better record than a monkey throwing darts. Yeah, there's going to be always a dispersion because, but if you look at the mean, it's exactly average. That's why they say to use a, a balanced ETFs and a balanced portfolio and just keep it in the market. Index funds. Index funds, yeah. Because the, the experts, they like to play a game like that. Psychologists, religionists, <laughs> uh, everybody thinks they're an expert and intuitionists and they're wrong, dead on. And he found that out when he was a young man. So he started studying all these other areas. What he found out, what Daniel Kahneman talks about in his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, it talks about this. He talks it like type one and type two thinking. Type one thinking is evolution has, evolution has given us this quick thinking, intuitional, using our past experiences. It's hardwired into us. So when the lion starts coming towards us, we don't think, oh, let's see, the lion's coming at me. Let's see, what should I do? Maybe I should run, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should get, no, no. By the same token, uh, well, I'll give you another example too. It's more important on ethics. If a person comes up from another tribe, you've never seen that person, you have, they figure 2.4 seconds to figure out whether that person's gonna kill you or help you. 2.4 seconds. 
and we'll find out later in uh, 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 Joshua Green's some of his studies, in Bell's studies, Joshua Bell's studies, this is really important because we're hardwired for empathy and love and devotion to our own tribe, but not beyond that. We're fearful of the other. The other is any other, other tribe. What are blacks? I mean, boy, I talk about the other. Chinese, you know, they look different. We know they're not in our tribe. So what happens is we're sympathetic, you know, in the, in the fast manual sense, we're instinctual, quick, you know, it's, it, it just combines all of our cultural, genetic, individual, individual experience. We make a decision quick. And most of our decisions are that way. Ethical decisions are that way a lot of times. But by the same token, we also have what he calls the type two, flexible or slow mode. And Joshua Green, by the way, uh, calls this the slow mode and the manual mode uh, on ethics. He's, he's applying this to ethics. <clears throat> in the slow mode, we're abstract. We think about theories about, you know, wait a minute. I, is this person really uh, bad? Would it be better maybe if I considered the inherent worth and dignity of that person as well? Maybe I should be compassionate to that person, even though, underlying this, I have no empathy for that person. That's important. I don't have empathy because they're from the other tribe. But maybe I should instill that, or I should think about it. Maybe there ought to be laws, you know, to protect all of us when we meet. Right? When we have our laws for it. So there's a big difference between the fast thinking and the slow thinking. Uh, do I need to tell you where liberals tend to concentrate? And certainly humanists. We're the more deliberate, flexible, uh, slow mode. Uh, yes. Uh, a mentor of mine years ago became, in the early years of the 60s, he uh, was a psychologist and became chief selection officer, uh, selection officer for the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And he and a couple of other, uh, of these, these guys, he was my landlord, and they would sit around, and this was in the early 60s, trying to make up tests to pick the best kids for the Peace Corps. Yeah. And several years later, uh, he told me their uh, exit interviews over the years, and by 1966, 67, they realized that all their predictive metrics were pretty much wrong. And that uh, the, the best grades, the best schools, and that the, the kids who really did the best in the Peace Corps were Midwestern kids from small towns, especially farms. <coughs> They grew up with practical skills, practical. but they also had the least prejudicial constructs right. in their mind versus smart people. See, once you got the prejudice, people. what does prejudice work towards? The fast manual mode. Here's something interesting to consider. In my book, I talk about it. You know, I grew up in a period where the feminism came into, into being, and rightfully so, it's wonderful and everything else. But the academic second wave femi feminist bought into the notion that, um, that rational thinking was male-only, male-dominated tools for power and control. And rational thinking certainly can be tools for power and control. But the problem is, once we start going on the intuitional mode, what is that? That's the fast manual mode. And that can lead to anything, all kinds of silliness, and has. Um, if we don't stop and think about some of these things, we can end up in all kinds of crazy ways. Yes, on the other hand, we can get an abstract and we can get uh, where we start rationalizing things too. So there's pitfalls both ways. Interestingly enough, the third wave feminists have, and I'll talk about that on Sunday, the third wave feminists have realized, especially with the ethical theory that is coming out, they reject all that. They're saying, wait a minute, we gotta, we gotta blend the best of both. As I always talk about what humanism is, it's the best of both heart and mind reason and compassion. It's been a blend of the, most, of the best of the Enlightenment and the Romantic traditions. But you can't have either or because then you end up, again, skewed values. Skewed values ends up being a dictatorship of all these other values get squashed down. So <clears throat> Kahneman, but Kahneman goes in great detail to say, after he, all of his analysis, that he looks at economics, psychology, a lot of other fields, uh, looks at crime rates and things like that. The big thing that we 
that if there's one way that if you're going to focus on one more or another, it's on the slow, flexible law. Because this is the way that we build systems of law, systems of justice. We build systems more important to see beyond the other and get beyond that disgust mode. Um, why do we, why are humanists, uh, uh, why does the American Humanist Association, the first organization, national organization, to support LGBT rights back in the late 40s. I mean, it was unheard of then. It was the first national organization. It's because they were using rational modes that of the, uh, affirming the inherent worth and dignity of each person. A lot of the people didn't like, were disgusted by homosexuals one way or another. So it doesn't matter whether they're disgusted, we're gonna get by that intuitional fast mode thinking and saying we're gonna give rights to these people because they deserve it. Any, you see, see how this works? This is really, really, I think, important today, and it's some of the most important things that we can learn from some of the major theories that are going on. Uh, well, as well on that, um, I'll talk about one other person, Paul Bloom. Paul Bloom um, is an ethicist um, on the humanist listserv that Jack and I are on. I put an email out, he's got a new book coming out, Against uh, Empathy. And what he was trying to say on that, he's not really against empathy. Oh, he's, he's not really against empathy. He's saying it's a bad decision-making tool for in some cases because of the tribalism thing. Empathy, we have lots of empathy for those around us in our immediate family and immediate tribe. But beyond that, there, it flips, the switch flips it flips totally and we don't have empathy. Why do you think the Sunni uh, Shia are killing each other? Because they're of a different tribe that must be killed. They certainly aren't doing the fast thinking, they're doing the slow thinking. Jonathan, oh, Paul Bloom, has, he's got a book I highly recommend, Just Babies. His point and um, uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, a lot of these people, John, Joshua Green, what they're really saying here is, we thought the ethics was one way, you know, all of these ethical theories and everything else, but in the end, we have to be careful about our psychology. It has much more impact on it because we'll rationalize anything. As I say, you know, we're not so much rational creatures as rationalizing ones. We'll make up any kind of shit to justify our own position, our own tribal position. So it takes those rules of law, those rules of evidence and, uh, uh, culture, what does it all bring together? I told you early on about different moral theories. I could give you all kinds more. I'm going to cut to the chase. We don't have time tonight. The bottom line for me is I'm a moral pluralist. If we go into a new garage and we're going to work on our car, we don't just have a hammer or a wrench or a screwdriver. We have a whole bunch of tools and we need all of those tools, don't we? My dad always told me, don't use a, a wrench as a hammer. Of course, I'll bet everybody here has probably used a wrench as a hammer. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. That's what happens in moral theory. Every one of our moral theories, I'm not a moral pluralist because I just want to be equ equitable to everybody. No, I'm doing it from rational terms. So all of our moral theories have serious downsides, serious flaws. And so we need a little of both, all of them. And I'll show you why. We need Kantian deontological ethics because they give us short, simple heuristics, rules of thumb that work in our real lives. You know, don't kill, don't cheat, don't steal. Um, but yet all of them, as we point out, have exceptions. So we have to realize that. In the end, I'm a consequentialist. I'm not a utilitarian, I'm a consequentialist. I'm gonna look in the end, what are the consequences? What's the most important thing? I go back to Dewey, remember I told you, our great humanist leader. What are the outcomes on this thing? And we need tools, even though we have the consequence, we're focusing on the consequences, uh, there's what's called rule-based consequentialism. And we need rules to help guide us. None of them are perfect, none of them are absolute, but they help guide us. By the same token, we need Aristotelian um, virtue ethics. 
We need to cultivate the best of who we can be in all of our uh, ethical attributes. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We need moral theory. What the, the studies from Haidt show that yes, uh, we need to make decisions sometimes real quick, but in the end, we really got to slow down, stop and think about these things, think about them rationally. Uh, Jack was saying that he was hoping I was going to talk about uh, empathy being the basis for uh, humanist ethics, and I totally agree with you. It's, t it's the most important thing in our daily lives is, is, um, is compassion and ethics, but guess what? The studies, and I, the, these are very, very sophisticated studies, by the way, by Bloom especially. They really tease apart all of these issues. There's a difference between compassion and sympathy and empathy. They have different criteria for all of these. In all of these cases, it's very hard to get beyond. There, uh, one of the books by Joshua Green is called Moral Tribes. <coughs> we all live in these moral tribes. We got, if we're going to be true humanists and really try and widen our circle of compassion, the only way we can do that is with moral theory. We don't kill people. We don't, you know, we use compassion beyond what we can. I can't empathize, you know, I can try to empathize with a child in, in, uh, in Iraq right now, but it's really hard. In the end, I have to use the tools of uh, uh, equal moral worth and dignity. I have to use the rules of law, all of these other tools. We just need that in our garage. So that's where I am. Uh, we got the, based on consequences, Peter, Utilitarians like Peter Singer and Joshua Green. By the way, utility, uh, Peter Singer, you know, he was the father of um, animal rights. You know, he wrote about animal rights. But even he writes that, that he's, uh, he, he calls himself, and he is in most cases, a pure consequentialist. But then you find him uh, waffling on it uh, about certain principles. Um, it also tells us what to do about, you know, the, the pan on humanism many times is we're only interested in human values. No. Humanism is dealing with the values from sentient, all sentient creatures. That could be an alien that comes down in the future. That might be, it might be an animal that we find is more sentient than now. The point is, all of those values, that's all we know, is our values from sentient creatures. And my values don't have to be just human values or for, or for humans. It can be for the earth, it can be for other animals. So that charge of anthropomorphism is ridiculous. It's dealing with, uh, if you're looking at the cause of our values or the outcome of our values, the cause is human values making, humans making values. It doesn't say what our values are gonna be. Remember I had the butterflies and chocolate? <laughs> Chocolate may be the ultimate value in the universe. Um, it's interesting, uh, I heard from Max Tegmark uh, at the AHA convention, and he says the ultimate, his theory in his book is the mathematical universe is that in the end, the universe is really based upon mathematics. Not that it can be defined as mathematics, but that is the ultimate reality, mathematics. And he presents a pretty effective scheme. That goes all the way back to Pythagoras school, by the way. So, you know, what is the bottom line for us as humanists? It's really looking at uh, what is the, and by the way, oh, I didn't get into Sam Harris, but there's a lot of humanists and secularists who are saying, oh, well, science tells us everything. We can get by the is our problem, uh, which is science. No, you can't. It's a big chasm. But the way we get it, is looking at human values, what are our human values? Realize that they are diverse, but there are higher values, but they're in radical conflict with each other. And ultimately, though, we have to choose. And there are, I believe that there are higher values based upon what serves us best. That's the end, bottom line. Uh, the, in philosophy, they used to call it, we were searching for happiness. But if we were searching for happiness, then we would live in this world of uh, the matrix-like world plugged in in pure bliss and everything else, or we would be shooting up heroin all the time in pure bliss. But guess what? We want something more beyond happiness. We want autonomy, just like that young girl in Omalas did. And remember, the title of that short story was Those Who Walked Away From Omalas. They didn't want to put up with it. 
I don't want to walk away from all the laws. I don't want to be a pure utilitarian. I do believe in consequentialism, but I also believe in those moral principles that's, that offended us so much of human dignity and rights and compassion that were lacking in all of us. That's why the people walked away. So when we're looking at all of our, in the end, of all of our humanist values, we, um, we're really searching for looking at those values and what's going to serve us best in the world, not just us, but everyone. And um, I wanted to read one, one thing here from, for you. Our hearts long for an integrated whole view of life that matches with reality. We long for a vital center to our lives that both grounds us and inspires us, a vision of grander authenticity to our lives, not just smaller truths. All of us long for an evocative whole story, a higher vision that lifts our hearts, moves our society, and pushes us to higher meanings and ennobles our lives. Some may find that integrated story is already here in a balanced humanism, <laughs> secular life of here and now, of heart and mind, reason and compassion, and accepting the exhilarating challenge of moving forward towards a responsible tr search for truth and meaning. The humanist life stance is based on values, not our beliefs. We're open-minded, critical thinking, science, justice, freedom, tolerance, democracy, compassion, human rights, inherent worth and dignity, and human flourishing <coughs> all hold our web of belief together. We can't afford the luxury of just critiquing religion. We must tell our alternate story so those that are contemplating change know that there is an alternate worldview that can support them, inspire them, comfort them, and that the knowledge of science, while tentative, is surely for, firmer than blind faith. That the exhilaration of focusing on the here and now is more meaningful than otherworldliness. That hope and love are certainly better than hate and divisiveness. That compassion and responsibility can be balanced with self-interest and freedom. That ambiguity that is inherent in all of our value ethical life positions, I spoke of earlier, need not paralyze us though, but it does make it even more important that we reflectively consider all of our choices and consequences. Humanist ethics derives its power from affirming the inherent worth and dignity of all people and realizes if justice is to be given, only we can give it. If love is to be given, only we have the power. In this moment, in this hour, by not doing so, the opportunity is lost forever. Suffering not relieved is real suffering, not washed away by the hand of a loving God when we die. This world is all and enough, enough to fill us with joy and wonder and hope and awe, and that is our natural birthright. Now is our time, and now is our chance to move society towards reason and the good life. Now is our time to move society out of the dark ages of theocratic and ideological control towards human fulfillment. We cannot falter in the face of certain hostility, our own inherent ambiguity, and we cannot stand idly by waiting for a secular world to automatically shape itself. It is our duty to show that a secular world need not end in nihilism, but can build communities that embrace a progressive humanist ethical worldview of human and global good. And I thank you.